सेव किया था ना मैं सिर्फ इसलिए गया था क्योंकि उसने मुझे कॉल किया दैट्स इट बट लिसन तो सेव इट फॉर समवन एल्स जिंदगी में सेव करना जरूरी है मगर जब बात पैसों की हो सिर्फ सेविंग से काम नहीं चलेगा इक्विटी म्यूचुअल फंड्स में इन्वेस्ट कीजिए और अपने सेविंग्स को आगे बढ़ने का मौका दीजिए म्यूचुअल फंड इन्वेस्टमेंट्स आर सब्जेक्ट टू मार्केट रिस्क रीड ऑल स्कीम रिलेटेड डॉक्यूमेंट्स केयरफुली एल एन कैंट्रो सॉ दिस थ्रूटेड मेटल shattered glass garbage corpses lay still under these piles you knew them by their smell unmistakable as powerful as the gases from some putrefying swamp as our reporters convoy drove up to the lebanese coast one day the ghastly odor of rotting flesh suddenly enveloped the car you smell much more last week a colleague told the american journalist They've been clearing away the cadavers since. The memory of that 1982 campaign in Lebanon is not important just for the 17,000 odd civilian lives it claimed. Although the Israeli defense forces cut through their enemies, the campaign was a strategic disaster. The PLO was expelled to Tunisia, but thousands of its fighters remained. The IDF became mired in an unwinnable 18 year long war Hezbollah a far more lethal adversary than the PLO grew the problem of terrorism remained in only 6 weeks of combat and 1 year of occupation Bradley Jacobs has noted in a paper produced for the United States Naval War College the IDF suffered 3316 dead and wounded The cost in blood Bradley calculated was demographically equivalent to the United States suffering 195,840 casualties in the same frame. Enraged by the savage jihadist attack of 7th of October 2023, which claimed the lives of at least 1200 of its citizens, Israel could be forced once more to learn that righteous anger is a very poor advisor. In 1982 there was no prime minister Benjamin Netanyahu to invoke the biblical enemy of the Israelites the Amalek whom God commanded King Saul to and I quote put to death men and women children and infants cattle and sheep camels and donkeys even back then former IDF chief Rafael Aitando vowed that I quote when we have settled the land all the arabs will be able to do about it will be to scurry around like drugged cockroaches in a bottle friedrich nietzsche the famous german philosopher famously observed that in individuals insanity is rare but in groups parties nations and epochs it is the rule israel's former prime minister menachem begin defense minister ariel sharon and foreign minister yitzhak shamir believed Lebanon could be reshaped by the use of military force into a friendly neighboring nation even though experts presented data on demographics and politics that challenged this notion political scientist Kirsten Schulz has observed that the advice of the experts was completely dismissed the israeli politicians hope was that by annihilating palestinian nationalism in lebanon where the plo had become entrenched it would also be wiped out in the west bank and gaza even though the plo and the syrians their allies had expected an israeli offensive they believed they were going to get a limited campaign along the lines of operation litani staged in 1978 this time though israeli spearheads used amphibious landings and overland movement along trails to completely reduce the enemy strong points the idf's 40000 men and 440 tanks overwhelmed the plo and its syrian friends who had only 15500 men and 110 tanks some of them dating back to the second world war and incapable of actually moving so the idf had its moment of complete decisive triumph and then things went horribly wrong the plo 
retreated into the dense urban milieu of western Beirut and melded into the Palestinian refugee population. The Shia population of southern Lebanon, which had chafed under PLO rule, soon came to resent the Israeli occupation. Hezbollah rapidly expanded and filled the space vacated by the PLO by providing services and facilities to the local population. Israel thus ended up finding itself at the gates of Beirut with no clear end game in mind, scholar Brian Parkinson has written. An 11-hour air bombardment exacted a hideous toll of civilians, leading to political division within Israel and intense pressure from its Western allies. US President Ronald Reagan even threatened to withdraw support for Israel unless the bombing of civilians ended. Like it's now doing in Gaza, the IDF engaged in siege warfare in Beirut, cutting off water, food, electricity and transportation for the population of more than 6 lakh people for over a month. A ceasefire involving the evacuation of the PLO leadership was eventually hammered out by diplomats. But more tragedy followed. Israel pushed for the entry of its Lebanese militia allies into Beirut to replace the PLO. The fascist militia of Ilay Hobeka slaughtered more than 2,000 Palestinian refugees in the camps of Sabra and Shatila as Israeli troops stood by. A subsequent judicial investigation in Israel whitewashed official culpability in the massacres Uri Avneri and Haulam Haze have recorded but Israel's international reputation was very severely damaged. Lebanon, for its part, remained profoundly unstable. Terrorist threats to Israel ended up multiplying and the nationalist rage that would eventually explode into the Palestinian Intifada or uprising simmered. Israel had achieved none of its strategic objectives. Few figures on the IDF's Actual successes in its counter-terrorism campaign in Gaza have emerged. But much of Hamas's highly decentralized leadership structure seems to be intact, experts suggest. Hamas has also proved that it has the skill to harass IDF tanks and patrols and then melt into the population. As journalist Zvi Barel notes, Hamas has embedded itself in the Palestinian political scene making it difficult to eradicate unless there's a genuine alternative first. The IDF likely knows in its heart what lies ahead. For an entire week during the Lebanese Battle of Ain al Hilwe, expert Sarah Parkinson has written, cells of Palestinian insurgents thwarted the Israeli military by using a maze of urban debris, alleyways and tunnels. They blew up the IDF's armoured personnel carriers and tanks using relatively small arms. That camp war was so lethal to Israelis that the IDF used to withdraw every night, sacrificing the territorial gains it made during the day. Eventually, Parkinson records, the IDF resorted to bombarding the camp with conventional ordnance and incendiary weapons, including white phosphorus, in order to take it, bulldoze the ruins and continue pushing north. So, the Palestinians were defeated in the Battle of Ain el Hilwe. But again, it did not yield a strategic victory for Israel. All Israel got was a persistent insurgency that bled its resources and inspired yet another generation of enemies. Hamas's success this time around, Josh Brenier notes, probably exceeded its own expectations too. Israeli intelligence officials now say that the killers were not expecting to encounter the hapless victims gathered for the music festival outside Kibbutz Reim in October. Like the 26-11 attacks in Mumbai and many similar hostages where civilians get caught in crossfire, at least some of the Israeli victims were killed by Israeli forces as they fought pitched battles with the Hamas attackers. The bottom line is the two sides have unleashed carnage with no achievable objective or strategic end in mind. Israel's conduct of urban warfare in Gaza shows it has learned few lessons from Beirut. Netanyahu's open-ended vow to take security responsibility for Gaza illustrates that he still hasn't thought through a political endgame. As Sarah Parkinson wrote in Foreign Affairs, and I quote, 
The military and humanitarian lessons of Lebanon strongly suggest that the current catastrophic conditions in Gaza will only grow more acute and there will be long-term disastrous consequences for all parties. War making is a useful tool if there are clearly defined political ends. In Gaza though, the conflict we are seeing is being driven by primal passions and hatreds. Israel will get revenge. But revenge isn't the same thing as the peace the country has so long and so desperately desired. I'm Praveen Swami and I'm contributing editor to The Print. Thank you for watching Security Code.